All right. It stopped a little bit. I'm pretty sure there's more people to come. But next, Georgia, welcome back from lunch. And Georgia will be introducing or like speaking to the mayor of Wilkinsburg, Marita Garrett. So I'm super excited to announce Mayor Marita Garrett, the current mayor of Wilkinsburg and also their first female mayor of color. Mayor Garrett graduated from Swickley Academy in 2004, and since then she's made so many strides towards breaking down all kinds of barriers built against her success. She's been in office since 2018 and has made her vision for the future extremely clear. Mayor Garrett devotes herself to her community with hopes to decrease the poverty rate and erase the perception that her community is riddled with crime and violence. Mayor Garrett has shown her devotion to these issues by enacting programs like Cure Violence, a gun violence prevention program. But above all, Mayor Garrett has been a huge inspiration to the future of representation of women and people in color in governmental positions. Women like Mayor Garrett break down social barriers and help push for a better future for those to follow her. Welcome, Mayor Garrett. All right. Thank you so much, Georgia, for that lovely introduction and welcome. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again, so Wickley, uh, my alma mater, uh, and um, Laverne Baker for inviting me to participate with you all today. So um, it's just really great because I know initially it was supposed to be, I think, in like March and April, obviously. So um, it's interesting to be on this other side of 2020 now that we are post election and really just seeing how this year has panned out because I definitely believe, um, you know, what I would talk about maybe seven or eight months ago when we were supposed to do this is a little bit different now that we've seen uh, COVID and just kind of how uh, everything's kind of panned out for this. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. My name's Marita Garrett, mayor of Wilkinsburg Borough. Not sure how many of you are familiar with where Wilkinsburg is located, but we are um, bordered the city of Pittsburgh around the Homewood and Point Breeze neighborhood. So we are in the Eastern part of the um, county. And uh, a lot of people may not even realize, but have probably drove through Wilkinsburg thinking that it was the city of Pittsburgh. So that's how close we are there. Uh, we have about 16,000 people as our residents and we're about 2.2 square miles. So basically what that means is that we are very densely populated. So we have a lot of people, even though it may seem small, we have a lot of people that really fill up that 2.2 square miles. And so I myself am actually originally from Akron, Ohio, but I've been um, in the Pittsburgh region for about the past 17 years, obviously went to Sewickley, and then I went to University of Pittsburgh where I graduated uh, and then actually ended up working as an outreach coordinator there for about uh, nine years. So Pittsburgh, this region just kind of kept me and uh, obviously then Wilkinsburg moved here 10 years ago and just keep going. And so one of the things that I want to share with you all, well, there's going to be a multitude of things, but, you know, especially with your generation being in high school, sometimes I feel when I was in high school, there was this really big push to like, you got to figure out what you're going to do. Like you have to know, like obviously college um, or whatever post-secondary option you choose is crucial, but also understanding that the next steps are still very development oriented. You're still young, you're still exploring. So I say that because when I graduated from college, I'm sorry, graduated from high school and started college, I was thinking I would be a doctor, specifically a pediatrician. I am far from that. I have now somehow, uh, you know, ended up in the great world of politics and all of those things, but I wouldn't have traded my journey for that anywhere. So just letting you all know, reminding you that you do not have to have it all figured out. There's still things that I'm figuring out and like, oh, I'm interested in this. Maybe try that path. So learning is continuous. It goes throughout the journey of you living because part of life is to always learn. So if you find yourself, oh, I might be interested in that, try it out. The more, the better. So I just, you know, some things that sometimes I wish I was more aware of when I was your age that now that I'm not and older, it's like, wait, I didn't have to have it all figured out. But one thing about politics, or I should say civic engagement, um, although I never saw myself having a career 
in politics from a young age, I was always very civically engaged and civically aware. And you're going to hear the word civically probably so many times throughout this because I love that word because obviously I founded a nonprofit called Civically. But um, but that was, you know, the norm in my family. I was raised in Akron, Ohio, specifically with my mother and my grandmother, where, you know, you give back to your community. As uh, one of my role models, the late great con Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm would say, service is the rent that we pay for living on this earth. And that's kind of where I live my life in. And so I was also raised up that way, volunteering in my DNA for, for holidays, Thanksgiving, we were volunteering um, the soup kitchens, uh, giving out dinners. It was just always part of that give back. And more so uh, for my grandmoms and because she was born and raised in Macon, Georgia in the 1920 South. So for her, voting was something that literally she lost family members who tried to get that right to vote. Where 1920 South, Jim Crow era, where voter suppression was high. Crazy enough, voter suppression still high. Um, yet, you know, that's when um, Jim Crow era, so you could kill a Black person who would try to vote or all of these things. So when she moved to uh, the North or Akron, Ohio, and that was something that didn't take for granted. Every election uh, was out there voting, but most importantly, taking me to vote with them. So obviously couldn't vote till the age of 18, but have been voting or in the polls uh, or the polling booths um, since like three or four, as young as I can remember. So then it became a thing where you got excited to actually vote. And now I'm seeing, you know, everybody's talking about the stickers again, but that was the thing when I was in grade school is that you wanted to go back to school and show your classmates, oh, I voted, I voted, look at this. So it was actually like a cool thing. So that got me more so excited. I'm not going to necessarily say about politics, but more so about this idea of participating, having my voice be heard, even though I didn't vote per se, I would talk to my mom about her choices and try to get more information on why she was voting. So it just felt like, you know, okay, our voices do count or our votes do count. Then, um, you know, just some of the things that um, kind of were going on. So I, now I'm going to date myself, but uh, so when I was in grade school, uh, President Bill Clinton was our president. Well, I feel so old saying that now, but it is what it is. And he was considered like the cool president. So, you know, when you would see him on the talk shows and different things like that, and it was just like, wow, you didn't think that you could quote unquote have a cool um, president. You know, it was kind of just felt like it was the stuffy role, but seeing him more of a pop um, icon, obviously Obama's exceeded that. So that's kind of, you know, the norm of what we're used to. But back then it was just like, oh, a president can like seem fun and nice. So that was kind of, you know, engaging too. And so I have to say my first time actually running for um, a position was, um, seventh grade, I was running for eighth grade social chairwoman. So a little traumatized from that experience. But uh, basically, um, you know, I thought, hey, this, let's do this. You know, I consider myself a social butterfly. I like to have parties, bring people together, all of that stuff. And um, I lost, but it was a, like a shoe ballot box. So people were probably extra stuffing it. So when we're talking about now, when people are saying, oh, there were more votes than there were people, that actually did happen. But that was again a shoebox ballot. Um, but you know, I just felt at that time, I was like, you know what? Politics, it's so dirty. You know, you lose friends. Our friend circle had split up um, over that race. And it was just like, you know what? I'm good. I'm just gonna keep, you know, being aware, civically aware and engaged, but politics definitely isn't for me. Uh, but then fast forward to uh, 2013, I um, was in my third year of living in Wilkinsburg, and I really wanted to get involved within my own community. In the role that I played at Pitt, I was an outreach coordinator for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So I was used to, you know, going out to other communities, spreading information and giving um, educational talks about Alzheimer's disease. But I really wanted to hone in on what's going on in Wilkinsburg. How can I be a part of some of the efforts that are happening here? And in 2013, um, I'm sorry, 20. 11, 2012, I joined some committees to get a feel for it. But in 2013, 
that's when um, the lid just kind of blew off of some of the things that were going on in Wilkinsburg, namely that our school district was actually placed on the financial watch list by the Pennsylvania uh, State of Education. And basically summing up what that meant is that if we didn't get our act together immediately, that we could have gone into receivership, the state would have taken that over. And you know, that's obviously not an ideal situation because anytime the state has to come in and take something over, then you lose that community, that public input, and you're just really at the will or kind of the ward of the state. So um, that was also an election year. Um, in the odd years, local elections are really key. So you had all the seats up for council, school board, mayors, judges, those types of seats. And a neighborhood group had reached out to really all residents and said, hey, listen, this is a pivotal election year. We need to do something like this could really change the trajectory of Wilkinsburg moving forward or are we going to regress, you know, all hands on deck. So I responded, you know, sure, I would love to help out. I attended an interest meeting and I was all ready, you know, to help support a candidate, you know, pass out some flyers, make some calls, whatever needed to be done. And so when I asked, you know, well, hey, who's running um, in my ward? Wilkinsburg is split up into wards. Who's running in my ward? And people were just like, oh, no one's running against the incumbent. And I was like, okay, well, tell me a little bit about the incumbent. And um, they couldn't tell me anything about the incumbent. I was like, okay. So I talked to some of my neighbors and they didn't know who the incumbent was. They're like, no, I've never seen her. Don't know, whatever like that. And so she was running for her third term. But to me, if you've been in for eight years, and no one can say anything, you know, good about you, no one can say anything bad about you, then obviously you don't, you're not having an impact, period. And so they kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, maybe you'll run. And I'm like, mm, no, you know, given my experience in middle school, those days are behind me. Uh, I don't want to go down that route again. But then you realize at a point, if not you, then who? And then also, I feel that I shouldn't be willing to ask someone to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So I really thought about it, prayed, meditated on it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna run for office, let's do it. So I ran for council person um, in 2013 for Wilkinsburg in my ward, ward one. And even when I started running initially, I was still thinking, okay, maybe if she sees, uh, maybe if the incumbent sees that, you know, I'm running, maybe she'll get her stuff together and then I don't have to run and it all works out. You know, how naive I was, it'll all work out. And um, she didn't, but one of the telling signs was when I was knocking on doors, cause I'm a firm believer in, you know, movement should be grassroots based. And so knocking on doors, make, having the my neighbors, people, again, I'm new to the community, having them know who I am, what I'm I'm about putting a face to the name. And so when I was talking to someone and they were just saying, you know, yeah, um, that was the same year that uh, Mayor Bill Peduto was running for his first time um, to be mayor, or the first time he won as mayor in 2013. And they had a Peduto yard sign in their yard in Wilkinsburg. No biggie. That's fine. And, you know, I went to knock on the door and the person was just like, oh, I'm only concerned about voting for Peduto. And I had told him like, you know, oh, well, you can't vote for Peduto. This is Wilkinsburg. And they said, yeah, so I'm going to vote for Peduto. And I'm like, no, you can't vote for Peduto. This is Wilkinsburg. And he's like, I know. And I'm like, no, Wilkinsburg is separate than the city of Pittsburgh. And then he just looked at me with like the deer in the head, like, look like, what? What do you? And I said, we're our own municipality. Like, you can't vote for a city of Pittsburgh. Here's who's going to be on your ballot. Here's like the people running. And, but it was crazy to me that here a homeowner didn't even realize where he really lived. So if you have residents who didn't understand the identity of their neighborhood and community, how do we expect them to get more engaged and involved? That also shared to me that there was a disconnect between our residents and our elected officials, because how are people just thinking, oh, I can just vote for Peduto? So that showed there was a detachment between, again, our, our residents and our elected officials. And then that was really the moment that sparked me like, okay, we have to go 150% because this is out of, this is crazy. This is out of control that our own residents don't even realize where they live. So really my campaign 
became more than about me. Like me knocking on doors was more of a civic engagement lesson. I was telling people, okay, this is where you vote. Here's the people on your ballot. Like here's the elections that are up, you know, all of these things. And so thankfully I did win. Um, and the one of the first things I did as being a councilwoman in 2014 was do Wilkinsburg community conversations. Cause I just wanted to get our residents together, our people together, just to say, okay, here's who this person is. Here's who your school board member are. Here's who the mayor is. Here's who the judge is. Just so now people can start putting a name to a face or just know who's representing them. So through community conversations, basically um, that's where you started or that's where I started seeing more engagement at some of our, um, you know, the borough committees, authorities, where people now wanted to participate because now you know who your neighbors are. Now you know how things are ran in your community. So all that, you know, working, being on council for four years, and then the decision to run for mayor, they were actually two different kind of experiences. And sometimes a lot of people, you know, may assume, um, given kind of this region, that there was a lot of maybe racism I faced in running for office. And it actually wasn't. Wilkinsburg is a predominantly Black uh, community. But what I did face the first uh, run in 2013 was actually ageism. So they were, um, and when I say they, the kind of then majority of incumbents and council people were upset that me as a young person knew wanted to run for office. So in one breath, you know, you hear, oh, we need more young people involved. Well, now that a young person's getting involved, now it's they don't have enough experience or they haven't been around long enough to know how it works. Well, that's how you get experience. You run for office so then you can build upon that and add to that. So it was just little, it was literally so crazy to me. And then one breath seeing these people in other places saying, hey, we need more young people participate, get involved, but it's only at their discretion that do you want young people to get involved. So I say that because, um, you know, with you all being young in your generation, you're gonna face that. You're gonna have people say, oh, you're too young, you're too young for this. But your generation also really has come out in a big way this year, pushing the needle on issues and topics that maybe even my generation, being an elder millennial, we weren't even thinking about. You know, we didn't have a global pandemic going on. You know, we were going to school in person. We also didn't have access to the technology that you all do at your in your at your fingertips. And you know, these platforms, you know, what cracks me up is just the use of TikTok in politics, you know, it started off just something fun for COVID, but when you're finding out, oh no, they actually like purchased these tickets at a rally. And, you know, the rally ended up having, uh, I don't even know if it happened, but that. And then also like taking over, you know, understanding the analytics so that when someone um, puts a hashtag for this, now it's associated with like a pancake or something and it takes away from that. So just things that I would have never even, you know, thought of, but, you know, your generation also discussing, um, I mean, all the things, but climate, environment. Um, my generation, we were just like, okay, maybe recycle when you can't, you know, all of these things that by you all pushing the needle, it's even I'm learning from and I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't realize the impact of that. I didn't realize all of those things. And I think each generation, when we're younger, we all get a bad rep, right? It's like, oh, I've never seen kids. They weren't like this growing up in my day or, you know, whatever like that. And it, that begets that, which begets that. But you all are our future. You are like really our present and our future. And that honestly is what gives me hope, you know, the outcome of the election four years ago, where it was really a turning point in our nation. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, there were times I felt a little hopeless, like, you know, is it even worth being in politics? What are, what am I doing? Is this all for not? Where are we going? But seeing you know, the, the Gen Z seeing you all like, no, nope, we're not taking this. We're going to protest this. Nope. We demand our rights. Nope. We're not. Nope. Nope. And I'm like, 
yeah, like we're going to be all right. We're good. We're good. Even if my generation, you know, we do what we need to do to help add the foundation, build upon what you all are doing. I at least know that you all have taken the wheel and really driving the change forward. Again, having discussions that we would never have even discussed or even had thought to discuss, you know, 20 uh, years, like 10 years ago, really. So recognizing that fire within yourself, making sure that you all know that regardless of your age, regardless of whether you're 12, 14, 16, 18, that your voice matter, your voice counts, especially in education. That's actually one thing um, that needs to be explored more to me is lowering the voting age for at least voting in like school board elections. Cause that's crazy to me that you all can't even vote on direct education policies and impacts that impact you. So, you know, again, making sure, recognizing that, okay, even if you can't vote right now on those things, your voice, your presence really still matters and to hold in onto that. And I'm so happy that we're actually kind of having this conversation post, um, post-election because between the show out of new registered voters, first time voters who were so excited to get out there and vote this election. And then also seeing now this new turning point within America or the United States of America that it lets me know, or I should say, it gives me that renewed sense of hope that we are headed on the right path, but that is in no doubt a huge part to you all again, you know, having those conversations with your parents, because that's hard, you know, having them recognize, you know, just because that was acceptable and some things were okay when you were coming up, this is what's really right. This is what equity is. This is what being anti-racist is. Those are hard conversations to have, but you all are having that and driving the change. So for that, I am so appreciative of, and really just, you know, recognizing your own worth and voice. I can't harp on that enough because you are making a difference whether you see it or not but people are watching and right now being in high school being in middle school here at SA um, that's just the beginning there's so much more out there it doesn't even barely begin here it just starts you know the world really is your oyster so I think I've probably gone on uh, way too long uh, but I definitely want to open it up for Q&A right now yeah, I have a question. So the theme of our conference is for the future. So what advice do you have for young people in Pittsburgh who want to become more involved in their community and where, how can that person get started? Absolutely. So you can get started just going to, I mean, it's kind of hard now, but I guess virtually um, just going to a community meeting. It doesn't even have to be a council meeting. Sometimes there's um, neighborhood groups or meetings. Like I'm part of a neighborhood association where I live and they'll just meet like, hey, here's what's going on in our parks or, you know, keep an eye on that. Um, there's there's no never a shortage of meetings, that's for sure. So even just to get a pulse of like, oh, OK, here's what's going on. Um, a great way is cleanups. Um, in Wilkinsburg, we have a lot of community cleanups, and that's always a great way just to plug in because you're talking with your other neighbors and residents. Obviously, you're cleaning up together, but it's also a great time to fellowship and network and kind of hear about, oh, that's what's going on on that street, or here's what's going on in my block. So literally just kind of plugging in how to, um, you know, kind of hearing what's going on, uh, but just really hopping in there. I have a quick question. What was the most rewarding part? What is the most rewarding part about being um, a figure in, like a, a major figure, a political figure in this, I mean, society? And I guess during the COVID-19 pandemic, how has that affected you and your position? Yeah, absolutely. So to answer your first question, um, what are the most rewarding things of being um, an elected official is when I was first ran for council, there weren't like anybody my age who was running for office or even held office or maybe been a few other people. Um, and sometimes people are like, why are you running for office? Like, that doesn't even make sense. You know, you should be at happy hours, but I'm like, but you know, I pay taxes now. So I'm interested in what's going on. So fast forward to 2020, most of my friends either now are elected officials 
our running campaigns, our committee person, like are all engaged. So it's great that we all kind of have this life and everyone understands now like, oh, that's why they're busy. They're doing this and they're doing this. And so being, uh, having more of that network, almost, I guess I should say a coalition where there's other young elected officials, other black women now um, holding office in these spaces, other women period, but just even the fact that the age, you know, median age has dropped where now it's really being amongst my peers when I'm going to these political events. So that's been rewarding to see that, you know, one of the things I always tell people, don't wait your turn. A lot of times, um, you know, what they say, the old boys club will say like, it's not your turn. There's a, you know, like there's a line to run or, you know, do things that you want to do. If you know there's a passion and you have that commitment to see it out, don't wait your turn. Um, and then also to answer your other part on COVID-19 leading through a pandemic, um, just, you know, every day is not like the same. Just like right now, we're experiencing um, an increase of cases of COVID-19. So having to remind people again, hey, you have to mask up, stay home. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's constant rerouting, but most importantly, making sure that my residents, my community have access to immediate needs. So working with organizations like the Free Store Wilkinsburg, that's a part of civically, making sure we're still able to meet the needs of you know distributing free clothing uh free items uh fresh food we do produce distributions um, we're also working on rent help uh, preventing people from uh getting evicted or foreclosures so in addition to you know looking in the future for wilkinsburg but also making sure we're handling the immediate and most pressing needs of our residents right now um and then the last question is, um, what did you study in college and how do you feel like your education has helped you to inform your current work? Like when you were in college, did you know that you were going to go into politics or did you have, you said you had a medical route, right? Yeah. And then something called organic chemistry just rerouted that. But um, I, my, so my, my, uh, my major in in college was psychology and I actually got my master's in psychology. And I did that because I thought um, I would go into being a psychiatrist or a licensed counselor. And so what I will say is um, having my master or having a background in psychology gives me the gift to listen uh, which a lot of people don't necessarily do. Obviously, I have to be vocal about issues. I'm a vocal person, but I also recognize the beauty and power of also listening. So, you know, nine, to nine times out of 10, people just want to feel heard and be acknowledged. So when residents or constituents are calling me, even if it's in complaint, I just listen first. And then I address what it is they want. It may not be the answer they want, but I at least listen to let them voice what they need to say and move forward. So I will definitely say my background in psychology really helped with kind of that pivoting of what to listen for and what you know terms or words to extract and then go to address it. Um, overall, what I'll say about um, high school or Swickley, um, which was great preparation for college, was um, really holding us accountable. So, you know, uh, sometimes I feel, you know, there's maybe not enough accountability for individuals, regardless of their age. But one thing about Sawickly definitely taught me, like, you have to take ownership of what you do. Every action has repercussions. So if you're not, you know, it's on you to study, we're not going to force you to study, but then you may not get a good grade. So, you know, you really are accountable and have ownership of how you want to perform. Um, in this um in this uh, institution we have one last question from the q a section um the transition from high school to university and post post graduation can be tiring what tips do you give younger students to stay motivated and to take care of their health yeah um whew, that is is hard definitely high school to college is very hard um and again, it goes back to that accountability. So the tips I would say are to give yourself grace 
you know, I think sometimes people, you know, we come from high school into college and it's just like this brand new world and you feel like you have to do all the things and you want to do all the things because you're so excited to do them all. But, you know, definitely remember your um, academics and studies come first, but also college is about the people too. So just kind of give yourself grace to navigate how that looks like and also be aware that, you know, people who you're friends with freshman year may not be the same friend senior. That's just life. That's just part of the evolving process. But again, you just have to give yourself the grace in navigating that initial transition because that it really is kind of that culture shock. Yeah, so thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate hearing from you and um, hearing your experience um, and your true inspiration to women and people of color. Um, I'm now going to send it over to Desi. All right. Well, again, we thank you, Mayor Garrett, for your words of wisdom and your time. Thank you. Thank you all for having me so much. I appreciate that. And um, I did get one um, question, and this is, I think, a very um, good question. Is Can I read it real quick? Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so basically the attendee asked, um, that I say, I want to lower voting age for some things. Why allow young people to make important decisions about the future of their country long before they are allowed to buy alcohol and nicotine products in a similar vein? Why can someone be drafted and taught to shoot a firearm put in the middle of war zones three years before they are allowed to buy and have their first drink? So all very valid questions. And that is something that, um, would be a U.S. mandate because when you look at other countries, their ages are kind of even kiltered. It's really the U.S. where it's like 21 here, 18 here, this, that here, and there's really not that consistency. So again, that's something where um, you all can really be the voice in advocating for that change and more consistent age policies and reckoning, well, why is it that um, I can be drafted at 18, but can't have my first drink at 21 or those types of things. So that's definitely, um, again, an advocacy issue that could be, excuse me, highlighted. All right, thank you. All right, thank you all. Stay safe, take care. Thank you. All right. All right, well, good afternoon, students and faculty. Um, we will now begin our closing of the lead conference. I just wanna take our last moments together to thank everyone for attending the 2020 virtual lead conference. As we know, this is a day where it enables students to learn about equity, acceptance and diversity while given the opportunity to hear different perspectives of youth voices in our community. We also wanted to show our appreciation for the panelists and keynote speakers who took time out of their day, sorry, to participate in our student-led event. We are truly grateful for your contributions and hope their stories and accomplishments inspired our student body to push beyond the boundaries. I also wanted to recognize the SDLC council members, specifically shout out to Madison Martin for creating this great slideshow. You're greatly appreciated for that. Also the advisors, and we wanted to let you know all your hard work is appreciated and what you're doing is important part of our healthy, prospering academic environment. In conclusion, to all the student participants, I hope that you enjoyed and learned a lot in your presentations. And if you take anything away from today, it's to help implement lead principles that benefit you to become a leader for the future. So now I'll give it on to Madison and she's gonna play y'all a video. So the video will queue up in just one second. So here you go for the future. Okay. Sorry guys, we're gonna replay the video. Okay, the sound okay. isn't, we're gonna get the sound working. Just one second.
Okay. For the future. 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 So again, I just want to thank everybody for coming and joining us. I want to give a special thanks to Mr. O'Connor, Dr. Lau, Ms. Burton, and all the faculty who helped us make this day come true. I also want to thank our presenters for joining us today and sharing your voices and letting your voices be heard in our Circle Academy community and our community around us. And lastly, I want to thank our keynote speakers, writer Damon Young, our alumni yeah. panel. I also want to give a great thanks to Wilkins Mayor. So thank you all again for joining us and have a great day.